Hello, today I'm going to be doing an overview and teardown of the Sharp EL-160, Sharp EL-8, and Faceet 111, as well as giving this EL-60 a, a nice clean. It's sort of dirty. Not really quite showing up there. I paid about 60 euros for this as well as having to pay to have it shipped from the Netherlands. Alright, I'll be showing you how to operate this calculator. So for addition, you do 3 plus 3 positive equals. For subtraction, you do 7 plus 4 negative equals. To do multiplication, you put in the first number, hit multiply, put in the second number, and hit plus equals. To do division, you put in the first number, hit divide, put in the second number, and hit negative equals. And you'll see that that gives you a floating point number. Now those are the four basic functions of this calculator, but you also notice that there's four other keys along here. This toggle switch switches the calculator between memory mode and double precision mode. These buttons are clear memory, memory recall, and add to memory. The memory function is really simple. All it is is eight additional digits in the background. You can perform math and add it to the memory. and then call back your total. However, double precision mode is really weird. What it does is it effectively allows you to have 16 digits of precision, but only for multiplication and division results. It works like this. When the output of your division or multiplication would take up more than eight digits, then the memory will be used to store the eight least significant digits of that 16 digit result. For example, if we do an operation that will result in a nine digit output, you'll see that the display displays the eight most significant digits of the result. If we hit memory recall, it'll show us the least significant digits. If we hit clear, it'll show us the most significant digits again. And we can do that as many times as we want. If you hit clear memory, then it'll clear the memory and not show you that, but that's stupid to do. As you can see, this is the German version of the calculator. As you can see, the keyboard on this thing is absolutely filthy. The keyboard just lifts out, like this. Here's something I forgot to say at the start. On this number pad, there's some sort of mechanical system to allow you to only press down one key at once. As you can see, there is a lot more gunk inside the case as well. This calculator uses 12 DG12B tubes as well as one SP12A tube. If you look in this case, you'll notice two things. One is that it's absolutely filthy, and two is that the boards connect together as well as to the power supply and to the keyboard through this big back plane.
This is my Sharp EL8. I got it for $63 on OfferUp with this charger and this leather carrying case. When I got it, the carrying case was in a Ziploc bag because it was so sticky and filthy. And I washed it with water. And it's still kind of sticky, but it's not nearly as bad. The case has a couple interesting things about it. For one, the zipper, when it's at the end position, uh, if you push it down like this, it'll sort of lock into the closed position. And with the carrying handle, you can either have it in this position, where it's buttoned down here so that it's not exposed, or you can unbutton it and push it here and then it has a handle. When I got the calculator there was the name of a school written in Sharpie right here and I scrubbed it off. It works fully. Powers on. Just fine. It's largely the same as the Sharp EL160. It's a uh, eight digits and four functions. This alarm light is for if you are operating the calculator off of DC mode instead of AC mode because when you do that while well, it's plugged in it won't charge the internal battery. With almost every one of these older calculators there will be, there you can see it, a divot on the 5 key. Works the same way as computer keyboard has notches on F and J so that you can basically home yourself without having to look at the keyboard. This calculator is really easy to disassemble. There is only one screw right here. And then the calculator just lifts apart. Now you may notice that this is not stock. So the way that this thing operates off of the AC wall power is that apparently it needs a capacitive load to actually start the calculator and have it power on and usually the internal battery works for this. However, they have a tendency to leak after 50 or so years, and so you can replace them with capacitors of around 470 microfarad, and it may look like the capacitor is soldered directly to the original battery connector, but it's not. It is soldered to these just socket pins. They're just socket pins. And the capacitor is hot glued to the back here, so that lets me operate it off wall power without concerns of the battery leaking and damaging the internal. This is the original battery that was in the calculator. If you look closely here, you can see that there is corrosion on the connector and that they're pretty much on the verge of leaking completely. You can mod these and replace the cells inside, but it's just really not worth the effort. Also, even if the batteries don't leak, they often still won't allow the calculator to turn on as the cells have exploded and don't suffice as a load. So a lot of people will throw away the old chargers thinking they don't work and solder power connections directly to the board, which isn't the end of the world, but it's suboptimal. I would take the connector off to prove to you that it's not soldered on, but the fit is really tight and I'm worried it would just rip the, hot, the capacitor off of the plastic. Removing the internals from the front case is also pretty simple. There's a grounding lead attached to this screw. And there's also a dust cover for the power switch. I absolutely love how the internals look. They look far better than <laughs> that Sanyo that everyone pairs up for Ghostbusters props. And it, it's just, it feels so small for what it is. It's so brilliant. Another thing, everyone uses these dark green filters for vacuum fluorescent displays. I don't get it. Their displays, I think, look much brighter and prettier without it. Look at that. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, I love it. This keyboard is also really nice. There are some other things I enjoy about the design of this calculator. For one, 
it's basically two boards connected to this one back plane connected to the keyboard. So this is the logic board, it slides out, and this board right here is the display board and it runs along the length of the calculator, and that also comes out. And I believe that that also includes this power supply section. Uh-oh. Alright, so there's a few things to note here. The keyboard is basically the part cage. And the keyboard, I believe, uses read switches. This one, uh, unlike the EL160, does not prevent you from pressing multiple buttons. Here's the processing board. There's four of these beautiful gold and white ceramic chips. They're on top of like a piece of paper or something. For some reason on this board, this chip is discolored. And on the display board, we have some resistors, a bunch of chips, and nine vacuum fluorescent display tubes here. I love the grid over these VFDs. There's a mesh all in front of them. I've heard that it's for blocking EF, but I don't know how much of a concern that would be. My personal theory is that it was to mimic the look of Nixie tubes and how the digits could be seen through a grid because the Nixie tube desktop calculators were quite expensive, so it could have been a thing that made your calculators look luxurious. And there's one more thing that I wanted to say about these boards, and that is that is how they solder masked the board. You'll notice it's kind of just done in chunks around the pins. How I think that this worked was they would have just the bare board and then they would just use a piece of tape over where the pads would be and then they just slathered the rest in solder mask. There we go. If you're, you're reassembling it when you're screwing down this ground connection, you'll want to make sure that this bit is not on top of this, otherwise you'll just bend it upwards and the case won't close properly. This is the facet 111. This calculator, I bought it untested from a guy in the Netherlands uh, for 40 euros. He didn't have a charger for it, and that's, I think, actually a pretty decent deal for one of these. Half the reason I felt confident in buying it is that they're built like a fucking tank, and that I already have a charger for this model. And this calculator is basically just a rehoused Sharpie LA. When I first got it, I got it in with a couple other calculators from the same guy. And at first it didn't work. I got it, and I plugged it in immediately, and it wouldn't turn on. That very day, I took it apart, and I looked inside, and the battery had leaked. This one. This one's leaked a bit more than the other one. You see the case is popped apart. And so I looked inside and there really wasn't that much corrosion. In fact, I wasn't able to notice any at first, but on the processor board, there was corrosion on approximately one pin. And so I cleaned that off and plugged it in and uh, it still didn't work. But then I put in the battery from the other one and it did work. Now I don't know why the error light stays on on this one. And you can see it says use type 11111 only, so that was uh, Facet's part number for the Sharp brick, the Sharp uh, EL81. On the inside it's just a Sharp EL8. All they changed was the case and the colors of some of the keys.
It's exactly the same calculator. <laughs>